Chapter Fifteen of Red Money by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, Guesswork. Whether Miss Greeby found a difficulty, as was probable, in getting Silver to hand over the forged letter, or whether she had decided to leave the solution of this mystery to Mother Cockleshell, it is impossible to say but she certainly did not put in an appearance at lady agnes pine's town house to report progress until after the new year nor in the meantime did she visit lambert although she wrote to say that she induced the secretary to delay his threatened exposure the position of things was therefore highly unsatisfactory since the consequent suspense was painful both to agnes and her lover and of course the widow had been duly informed of the interview at the cottage and naturally expected events to move more rapidly however taking the wise advice of isaiah to make no haste in time of trouble agnes possessed her soul in patience and did not seek out miss greeby in any way either by visiting or by letter she attended at her lawyer's offices to supervise her late husband's affairs and had frequent consultations with garvington's solicitors in connection with the freeing of the lambert estates everything was going on very satisfactorily even to the improvement of lambert's health so agnes was not at all so ill at ease in her mind as might have been expected certainly the sword of damocles still dangled over her head and over the head of lambert but a consciousness that they both were innocent assured her inwardly that it would not fall nevertheless the beginning of the new year found her in anything but a placid frame of mind she was greatly relieved when miss greeby at last condescended to pay her a visit luckily agnes was alone when the lady arrived as garvington and his wife were both out enjoying themselves in their several ways the pair had been staying with the wealthy widow for christmas and had not yet taken their departure since garvington always tried to live at somebody else's expense if possible he had naturally shut up the manor during the festive season as the villagers expected coals and blankets and port wine and plum puddings which he had neither the money nor the inclination to supply in fact the greedy little man considered that they should ask for nothing and pay larger rents than they did by deserting them when peace on earth and good will to men prevailed or ought to have prevailed he disappointed them greatly and chuckled over their lamentations garvington was very human in some ways however both the copulent little lord and his untidy wife were out of the way when miss greeby was announced and Agnes was thankful that such was the case, since the interview was bound to be an important one. Miss Greeby, as usual, looked large and aggressively healthy, bouncing into the room like an India rubber ball. Her town dress differed very little from the garb she wore in the country, save that she had a feather-trimmed hat instead of a man's cap, and carried an umbrella in place of a bludgeon a smile which showed all her strong white teeth in a somewhat carnivorous way overspread her face as she shook hands vigorously with her hostess and miss greeby's grip was so friendly as to be positively painful here you are agnes and here am i beastly day ain't it rain and rain and rain again seems as though we've gone back to father noah's times don't it i expected you before clara remarked lady agnes rather hurriedly and too full of anxiety to discuss the weather well i intended to come before confessed miss greeby candidly only one thing and another prevented me agnes noticed that she did not specify the hindrances it was the deuce's own job to get that letter oh by the way i suppose lambert told you about the letter mr silver told me about it and i told no responded agnes gravely i also heard about your interview with oh that was ages ago long before christmas i should have gone and seen him to tell about my experiences at the gypsy camp but i thought that i would learn more before making my report as a detective 
by the way how is lambert do you know he is all right now and is in town at his old rooms i suppose for how long i want to see him for an indefinite period garvington has turned him out of the cottage the deuce what's that for well said agnes explaining reluctantly you see no paid no rent as garvington is his cousin and when an offer came along offering a pound a week for the place garvington said that he was too poor to refuse it so noel has taken a small house in kensington and mrs tribb has been installed as his housekeeper i wonder you don't know these things why should i asked miss greeby rather aggressively because it is mr silver who has taken the cottage miss greeby sat up alertly silver oh indeed then that explains why he asked me for leave to stay in the country said his health required fresh air and that london got on his nerves hm hm miss greeby bit the handle of her umbrella so he's taken the abbot's wood cottage has he i wonder what that's for i don't know and i don't care said agnes restlessly of course i could have prevented garvington letting it to him since he tried to blackmail me but i thought it was best to see the letter and to understand his meaning more thoroughly before telling my brother about his impertinence noel wanted me to tell but i decided not to in the meantime at all events silver's meaning is not hard to understand said miss greeby dryly and feeling in her pocket he wants to get twenty five thousand pounds for this she produced a sheet of paper dramatically however i made the little animal give it to me for nothing never mind what arguments i used i got it out of him and brought it to show you agnes hauling slightly took the letter and glanced over it with surprise well she said drawing a long breath if i had not been certain that i never wrote such a letter i should believe that i did my handwriting has certainly been imitated in a wonderfully accurate way who imitated it asked miss greeby who was watching her eagerly i can't say but doesn't mr silver oh he knows nothing or says he knows nothing all he swears to is that chaldea found the letter in pine's tent that day after his murder and before inspector darby had time to search the envelope had been destroyed so we don't know if the letter was posted or delivered by hand if i had written such a letter to noel said agnes quietly it certainly would have been delivered by hand in which case pine might have intercepted the messenger put in miss greeby it couldn't have been sent by post or pine could not have gotten hold of it unless he bribed mrs tribb into giving it up mrs tribb is not open to bribery clara and as to the letter i never wrote it nor did noel ever receive it it was written from the manor anyhow said miss greeby bluntly look at the crest and the heading some one in the house wrote it if you didn't i'm not so sure of that the paper might have been stolen well miss greeby again bit her umbrella handle reflectively there's something in that agnes chaldea told mrs belgrove's fortune in the park and afterwards she came to the drawing-room to tell it again i wonder if she stole the paper while she was in the house even if she did an uneducated gypsy could not have forged the letter she might have got somebody to do so suggested miss greeby nodding then the somebody must be well acquainted with my handwriting retorted lady agnes and began to study the few lines closely she might have written it herself so much did it resemble her style of writing the terse communication stated that the writer who signed herself agnes pine would meet her dearest noel outside the blue door shortly after midnight and hoped that he would have the motor at the park gates to take them to london en route to paris hubert is sure to get a divorce ended the letter and then we can marry at once and be happy evermore it was certainly a silly letter and agnes laughed scornfully 
"'I don't express myself in that way,' she said contemptuously, and still eyeing the writing wonderingly. "'And as I respected my husband and respect myself, I should never have thought of eloping with my cousin, especially from Garvington's house when I had such better and safer chances of eloping in town. Had Noel received this, he would never have believed that I wrote it, as I assuredly did not. And a motor at the park gates, she read, why not at the postern gate, which leads to the blue door? That would have been safer and more reasonable. Pah! I never heard such rubbish, and she folded up the letter to slip it into her pocket. Miss Greeby looked rather aghast. Oh, you must give it back to me, she said hurriedly. I have to look into the case, you know. I shall not give it back to you, said Agnes in a determined manner. It is in my possession and shall remain there. I wish to show it to Noel. And what am I to say to Silver? Whatever you like. You can manage him, you know. He'll make trouble. Now that he has lost his weapon, Agnes touched her pocket. He can't. Well, Miss Greeby shrugged her big shoulders and stood up. Just as you please, but it would be best to leave the letter and the case in my hands. I think not, rejoined Agnes decisively. Noel is now quite well again, and I prefer him to take charge of the matter himself. Is that all the thanks I get for my trouble? My dear Clara, said the other cordially, I am ever so much obliged to you for robbing Mr. Silver of this letter, but I don't wish to put you to any more trouble. Just as you please, said Miss Greeby again, and rather sullenly. I wash my hands of the business, and if Silver makes trouble, you have only yourself to thank. I advise you also, Agnes, to see Mother Cockleshell and learn what she has to say. Does she know anything? She gave me certain mysterious hints that she did, but she appears to have a great opinion of you, my dear, so she may be more open with you than she was with me. Where is she to be found? I don't know. Chaldea is queen of the tribe, which is still camped on the outskirts of Abbot's Wood. Mother Cockleshell has gone away on her own. Have you any idea who wrote the letter? Agnes took out the forged missive again and studied it. Not in the least, she said, shaking her head. Do you know of any one who can imitate your handwriting? Not that I know. Oh! She stopped suddenly and grew as white as the widow's cap she wore. Oh! she said blankly. What is it? demanded Miss Greeby on fire with curiosity. Have you thought of any one? Agnes shook her head again and placed the letter in her pocket. I can think of no one, she said in a low voice. Miss Greeby did not entirely believe this. As the sudden hesitation and the paleness hinted at some unexpected thought, probably connected with the forgery. However, since she had done all she could, it was best, as she judged, to leave things in the widow's hands. I'm tired of the whole business, said Miss Greeby carelessly. It wouldn't do for me to be a detective, as I have no staying power, and get sick of things. Still, if you want me, you know where to send for me, and at all events I've drawn Silver's teeth. Yes, dear, thank you very much, said Agnes mechanically, so the visitor took her leave, wondering what was rendering her hostess so absent-minded. A very persistent thought told her that Agnes had made a discovery in connection with the letter, but since she would not impart that thought, there was no more to be said. When Miss Greeby left the house and was striding down the street, Agnes, for the third time, took the letter from her pocket and studied every line of the writing. It was wonderfully like her own, she thought again, and yet wondered both at the contents and at the signature. I should never have written in this way to Noel, she reflected, and certainly I should never have signed myself Agnes Pine to so intimate a note. However, we shall see and with this cryptic thought she placed the letter in her desk. When Garvington and his wife returned, they found Agnes singularly quiet and pale. 
the little man did not notice this as he never took any interest in other people's emotions but his wife asked questions to which she received no answers and looked at agnes uneasily when she saw that she did not eat any dinner to speak of lady garvington was very fond of her kind-hearted sister-in-law and would have been glad to know what was troubling her but agnes kept her worries to herself and insisted that jane should go to the pantomime as she had arranged with some friends instead of remaining at home but when garvington moved to leave the drawing-room after drinking his coffee his sister detained him i want you to come to the library to write a letter for me freddy she said in a tremulous voice can't you write it yourself said garvington selfishly as he was in a hurry to get to his club no dear i am so tired sighed agnes passing her hand across her brow then you should have kept on silver as your secretary grumbled garvington however it won't take long i don't mind obliging you he followed her into the library and took his seat at the writing table who is the letter to he demanded taking up a pen in a hurry to mr jarwin i want him to find out where gentilla stanley is it's only a formal letter so write it and sign it on my behalf like an infernal secretary sighed garvington taking paper and squaring his elbows what do you want with old mother cockleshell miss greeby was here to-day and told me that the woman knows something about poor hubert's death garvington's pen halted for a moment but he did not look round what can she possibly know he demanded irritably that's what i shall find out when mr jarwin discovers her said agnes who was in a low chair near the fire by the way freddy i am sorry you let the abbot's wood cottage to mr silver why shouldn't i growled garvington writing industriously noel didn't pay me a pound a week and silver does you might have a more respectable tenant said agnes scathingly who says silver isn't respectable he asked looking round i do and i have every reason to say so oh nonsense garvington began to write again silver was pine's secretary and now he's miss greeby's they wouldn't have engaged him unless he was respectable although he did start life as a pauper toy-maker i suppose that is what you mean agnes i'm surprised at your narrowness ah uh, we have not all your tolerance freddy have you finished that letter there you are garvington handed it over you don't want me to address the envelope yes i do agnes ran her eyes over the missive and you can add a postscript to this telling mr jarwin he can take my motor to look for gentilla stanley if he chooses garvington did as he was asked reluctantly though i don't see why jarwin can't supply his own motors he grumbled and ten to one he'll only put an advertisement in the newspapers as if mother cockleshell ever saw a newspaper retorted his sister oh thank you freddy you are good she went on when he handed her the letter in a newly addressed envelope no don't go i want to speak to you about mr silver garvington threw himself with a growl into a chair i don't know anything about him except that he's my tenant he complained then it is time you did perhaps you are not aware that mr silver tried to blackmail me what the little man grew purple and exploded oh nonsense it's anything but nonsense agnes rose and went to her desk to get the forged letter he came to me a long time before christmas and said that chaldea found this she flourished the letter before her brother's eyes in hubert's tent when he was masquerading as hearn a letter what does it say garvington stretched out his hand agnes drew back and returned to her seat by the fire i can tell you the contents she said coolly it is supposed to be written by me to know and makes an appointment to meet him at the blue door on the night of hubert's death in order to elope agnes you never wrote such a letter cried garvington jumping up with a furious red face his sister did not answer for a moment 
she had taken the letter just written to jarwin by garvington and was comparing it with that which miss greeby had extorted from silver no she said in a strange voice and becoming white i never wrote such a letter but i should be glad to know why you did i did garvington retreated and his face became as white as that of the woman who confronted him what the devil do you mean i always knew that you were clever at imitating handwriting freddy said agnes while the two letters shook in her grasp we used to make a joke of it i remember but it was no joke when you altered that check hubert gave you and none when you imitated his signature to that mortgage about which he told me i never i never stampered the detected little scoundrel holding on to a chair for support i never spare me these lies interrupted his sister scornfully hubert showed the mortgage when it came into his possession to me he admitted that his signature was legal to spare you and also for my sake hushed up the affair of the check he warned you against playing with fire freddy and now you have done so again to bring about his death it's a damned lie it's a damned truth retorted agnes fiercely i got you to write the letter to mr jarwin so that i might compare the signature to the one in the forged letter agnes pine in one and agnes pine in the other both with the same twists and twirls very very like my signature and yet with a difference that i alone can detect the postscript about the motor i ask you to write because the word occurs in the forged letter motor and motor both the same it's a lie denied garvington again i have not imitated your handwriting in the letter to jarwin you unconsciously imitated the signature and you have written the word motor the same in both letters said agnes decisively i suddenly thought of your talent for writing like other people when clara greeby asked me to-day if i could guess who had forged the letter i laid a trap for you and you have fallen into it and you she took a step forward with fierce glance so that garvington retreating nearly tumbled over a chair you laid a trap for hubert into which he fell i never did i never did babbled garvington gray with fear yes you did i swear to it now i understand why you threatened to shoot any possible burglar who should come to the manor you learned in some way i don't know how that hubert was with the gypsies and knowing his jealous nature you wrote this letter and let it fall into his hands so that he might risk being shot as a robber and a thief i i i didn't shoot him panted the man brokenly it was not for the want of trying you broke his arm and probably would have followed him out to inflict a mortal wound if your accomplice in the shrubbery had not been beforehand with you agnes i swear that i took pine for a burglar and i don't know who shot him really i don't you liar said agnes with intense scorn when you posted your accompl she had no chance to finish the word for garvington broke in furiously and made a great effort to assert himself i had no accomplice who shot pine i don't know i never wrote the letter i never lured him to his death he was more good to me alive than dead he never he was not more good to you alive than dead interrupted lady agnes in her turn for hubert despised you for the way in which you tried to trick him out of money he thought you little better than a criminal and only hushed up your wickedness for my sake you would have gotten no more money out of him and you know that much by killing him you hoped that i would get the fortune and then you could plunder me at your leisure hubert was hard to manage and you thought that i would be easy well i have got the money and you have got rid of hubert but i shall punish you punish me garvington passed his tongue over his dry lips and looked as though in his terror he would go down on his knees to plead oh not by denouncing you to the police said his sister contemptuously for bad as you are i have to consider our family name but you had hubert shot so as to get the money through me 
and now that i am in possession i shall surrender it to the person named in the sealed envelope no 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 don't don't yes i shall i can do so by marrying noel i shall no longer consider the financial position of the family i have sacrificed enough and i shall sacrifice no more hubert was a good husband to me and i was a good and loyal wife to him but his will insults me and you have made me your enemy by what you have done i did not do it i swear i did not do it yes you did and no denial on your part will make me believe otherwise i shall give you a few days to think over the necessity of making a confession and in any case i shall marry noel and lose the money you shan't shan't agnes stepped forward and looked fairly into his shifty eyes you are not in position to say that freddy i am mistress both of the situation and of hubert's millions go away she pushed him toward the door take time to think over your position and confess everything to me garvington got out of the room as swiftly as his shaky legs could carry him and paused at the door to turn with a very evil face you daren't spit on me he screeched i defy you i defy you you daren't spit on me alas agnes knew that only too well and when he disappeared she wept bitterly feeling her impotence end of chapter fifteen